All right, so uh, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, thanks for coming to the talk. Um, so the goal of the talk today is going to be for me to give you a sense of a particular technique um, which is used for either approximating or bounding some quantity that you care about, OK? And I'm going to try to give you some various applications in maybe these two places that seem very different. So let's see how it goes. So let's suppose I had some generating function or some generating polynomial, maybe called G. I'm going to write it out in terms of monomials. Say I have some coefficients, say G alpha, and then I have some monomial that looks like this. OK, I'm often just going to write this as follows. OK, so I'm just going to do a shorthand for this monomial to something like this. OK. The idea of this technique is the following. So let's suppose you have some quantity that, that you can encode, like you have some quantity that you want to, that you want to compute, um, but you know for some reason it's hard to compute, maybe for some reasons of the previous talk. OK. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to take these numbers that we care about, may they be counting something or maybe the probability of some event, something like this. We're going to try to encode them into generating functions or generating polynomials that have this law concavity property. And we're going to try to encode them in such a way that, that evaluating this is actually substantially easier than actually computing this, this coefficient. And then we're going to use some kind of convex optimization problem on this to try to then get some kind of bound or approximation on the thing we actually care about. So that is the that is the idea, um, and so let me uh, let me show you how this might go. So, a little more formally, this idea, which is due to Gervitz, is exactly. I'm just going to write exactly what I just said. So we want to relate some coefficient to a certain convex program. which is induced by a log concave, which I haven't really defined yet, generating function g. OK? And what is this induced convex program? He called it the capacity. OK? And it's defined as follows. So you're going to take some infimum over all inputs, uh, all xi's in the, in the strict, so all xi's strictly positive of the ratio of this generating function divided by sort of this monomial you care about. And again, I'm going to generally write this as a shorthand as follows. OK? So this may look kind of crazy, but I'm going to do a simple example in a minute, show you how this sort of thing might actually be useful. OK? So this was originally, oh, maybe I could have done some better board work here too. Um, can everyone see this? OK. Um, so originally, the, this was pioneered by Gervitz about 20 years ago to um, do a number of things. So to give sort of approximations to the permanent of a matrix with non negative entries, to the mixed discriminant of PSD matrices to the mixed volume of certain convex bodies, OK? And in particular, you can use this technique actually to recover this, uh, what used to be called the van der Waarden conjecture for permanence of doubly stochastic matrices, OK? Um, the lower bound for that was conjectured to be n factorial over n to the n in the 30s. It was proven in the 80s using some very complicated stuff related to the alexander fenkel inequalities. And Gervitz's proof about 20 years ago is, by comparison, extremely simple and uses some calculus. Um, and this thing, whatever it is, OK? A couple things I'll say about this. It's also not clear why this should be convex, um, but basically up to some transformation. So if I replace these x's by, say, e to the x, and I take log, I get something convex. So this is something easy to compute, OK? And it's also kind of dual to some entropy optimization problem. So if that means anything to you, then take it. Otherwise, don't worry about it. OK, so let's see why this we could expect this to help us at all. So here's a simple example. Let's suppose I just want to count permutations. Okay, hopefully something that I don't need this for, right? 
but let's see what I can do with it, okay? So let's suppose I have a univariate generating function, which encodes the counts of the permutations as follows. Maybe not quite exactly the counts, but one over the counts, okay? So these numbers that I'm assuming for the sake of this example are hard to compute. Here they are as the coefficients, and I have this very nice function that represents them, okay? So this thing is easy to evaluate, these count permutations. And in fact, um, it's, not, it's, not easy, it's not hard to show, but uh, this coefficient sequence is log concave in the sense that which just means that 1 over k factorial squared is greater than 1 over k plus 1 factorial times 1 over k minus 1 factorial for all k. Okay? And so now we're going to need a, a lemma from a recent paper with Peter Brendan and Igor Pak in the audience. So let me... It says the following, a g of x b, oh, this is uh, 23, a g of x be a univariate power series, with non-negative coefficients that are log concave. Then, we have the following relationship between the coefficients of this power series and this thing, which I'm now going to write. So for all n, Let me write it and then I'll tell you what I've written. Okay, so what does this say? It says this convex optimization problem, which I'm assuming to be sort of easy to compute relative to these coefficients, which is not exactly true here, but that's kind of the general assumption you want to hold. These coefficients can be bounded above and below by this optimization problem up to this factor, okay, which is something like 1 over e times n plus 1. Okay? So what we could do is we can apply it directly to our situation. And in fact, because I care about the inverses of these, I'm just going to invert this formula here, or this inequality here. And I'll have to reverse the signs. Sorry, that would be 1 over. Okay. And in this particular example, which is pretty simple, this expression is just some calculus problem. Okay, so you take the derivative, you find the zero, you figure out where it is. It turns out that the infimum is at x equals n. So you end up getting e to the n over n to the n. Okay. And so now if you just plug in everything, what you end up getting is something very close to, well, I guess depending on your perspective, some, something somewhat close to Stirling's approximation. Okay, it's basically off by root n. Okay, so I just plug this in here, cancels with this. I'm left with this. Okay. So this, of course, is some very simple example, but it's illustrative because it kind of takes, in my opinion, something kind of magical here and turns it into something 
that we, that we can do better than, of course, but something that is much more kind of intuitive or sensible, okay? And it's a little bit mysterious why this should have, this should have worked, okay? So but, yeah. This command a bit, how much different it is just from classical steepness descent? You know, steepness descent will say that okay, maybe you extract the deficient by an integral and then look at the critical point. So, I would say that the, the, what I'm going to do next is, I mean, basically, this was very illustrative in the sense that you would never do this for anything that was univariate. Anything univariate, there are far more better techniques. But the point of this was just to demonstrate how you would sort of, this unexpected thing might get you something that looks kind of right. And the next thing that we're going to do, the next question I'm going to ask is, okay, well, you know, like, yeah, as you point out, there's way better methods to do something like this. But what if what I care about is encoded in something much more complicated, something that is a multivariate generating series? And then I, at least, am not aware of how, the, how these other types of things will, will translate. So then the next question is, okay, um, yeah, how can we do something a little more interesting than this? Okay, any questions though before I move on? Okay, and that's going to lead into the first thing in the title, log concave polynomials. So I would say that log concave polynomials is really my kind of main area, um, but I don't have enough, I'm not going to have enough time to really go into a lot of details, so I'm just going to try to give you a sense of various classes of polynomials that are important to, to bounds that you can sort of get in this way. Okay, so. The thing we're always going to be looking at are polynomials with non-negative coefficients in n variables, and we're always going to assume that they're dehomogeneous. You don't really need to assume this last thing. Um, it's just going to make it easier for us. Uh, but the non-negativity of coefficients is usually pretty crucial. OK? And so there are three classes that I'm going to mention of log concave polynomials. There's going to be something in the middle called real stable. These have been around for a long time. They generalize too many variables real rootedness. I'll make that a little more formal. The next one have been around for maybe uh, either five years or 15 years, depending on your perspective. Um, they're called Lorentzian, or I'm going to shorthand completely log concave, or they were originally called strongly log concave. It turns out they're all equivalent, but we just didn't know that until later. Okay? And then finally, the weakest class is going to be something related to this. It has a pretty bad name called denormalized Lorentzian. And I'm, because it's such a bad name, I'm just going to say DL from now on. OK? So let, but, you know, without really getting into a lot of details, let me just give you, try to give you a sense of what these are and, and some examples that hopefully will pique your interest. So the first one is the innermost real stable. Like I said, they generalize real rooted polynomials. Okay, And what that means for homogeneous, so we're often going to be thinking of the univariate case in the homogeneous world as, as actually bivariate, because a bivariate homogeneous polynomial has a sequence of coefficients. So the univariate case is sort of like sequences, multivariate case is is like a grid of coefficients. Okay, so the bivariate homogeneous uh, case of real stable looks as follows. It's just things that can be decomposed um, into linear factors with non-negative coefficients. Okay, so it's a multivariate generalization of this. And some examples, which this is touching on, some of the stuff from the previous talks. So spanning tree polynomials. So what do I mean by that? I have a polynomial whose variables are indexed by the edges of some simple connected graph. I sum over all trees, and I look at the product of the variables associated to the edges in that tree. OK, by the matrix tree theorem, this has some very nice properties that make it somehow some generalization of real rooted. There's a lot of real rooted things going on. Okay? There's also something called determinantal polynomials. 
Okay, and that is going to look like something of this form. Okay, so you take a bunch of PSD matrices, you multiply them by variables, sum them, take determinant. Okay, these are somehow related to these determinantal point processes, but I, I am, I'm not an expert on that. I just, I know that these sorts of polynomials and their kind of properties coming from this come up in some of that literature. Okay, and there's a whole bunch more, but one more I'll just say are the elementary symmetric polynomials. They also have this property. Okay. The second group are these Lorentzian. That name is due to Petter Brenden and Jun Ha in about 18. Completely log concave. That name is due to Inari, Kui Kui Lu, Oves Garan, and Vincent in about 18. And then the other name is strongly log concave, which is due to Gervitz in about 09, something like that. Okay, and that's a, it's an interesting story. Maybe, I don't know, we'll see if I have, if I have time to say a lot about it. Um, so the way you want to think about these is as generalizing the notion of ultra log concave coefficients, if you've heard of this. What does that mean? It means that my bivariate Lorentz polynomial looks as follows. I have some binomial coefficients and then some coefficients x to the k, y to the d minus k, and we have the law con concavity inequalities for these coefficients here. Okay? If you know these Newton's inequalities that say for real rooted polynomials you get these inequalities, then somehow you can see that these should be a generalization of real stable. Okay? The examples here are matroid basis generating polynomials. Okay, it's, it's exactly the same as this, except now this is the ground set and now you're summing over bases, okay? This, the fact that these have this property and related polynomials are due to both of these groups simultaneously. This is how they were able to prove the Mason's, the strongest form of the Mason's conjectures, okay? This is also how this group was able to prove this kind of simple random walk mixes rapidly that Igor mentioned. Okay, it follows from the fact that this thing has whatever this property is. Okay, so this is some kind of also negative correlations property. That's something else you should be thinking. I'll mention that again in a minute. Okay, another example is volume polynomials. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it's basically like this, except you replace determinant by volume and you replace these matrices by convex bodies. So you write down this polynomial that Sui Hong wrote down, okay, and then it's gonna have this slightly more general property. Okay, and there are many more here. Okay. And the last class, which will be the most pertinent to what we're doing, these denormalized Lorentzian polynomials, they are then sort of the, the weakest condition, and they generalize Log concavity of coefficients. Okay, what does that mean? In the bivariate case, it's precisely that if you sum and you have your coefficients like this, then you, you have this log concavity inequality directly. Okay, so this is, this is stronger than being log concave. This is a weaker condition. Okay, and what's very interesting about these polynomials, this, the reason why the, this denormalized word is here is because all you do is you take a Lorentzian polynomial and you just adjust the coefficients in some way. You just scale them by some factorials. So it seems like it's a class that's sort of, I don't know, it's not that different from this somehow, and yet the, the thing that's, I think, very intriguing about this class is that it starts to contain some very interesting combinatorial polynomials. At least some of them are known for sure and, and a lot of them are conjectured. So in this paper of Jun Ha, Jacob Mathern, Carola Mazaros, and St. Dizier, I can't remember his first name. Um, say again? Avery. Avery, yep, Avery St. Dizier in 22. 
They show that all sure polynomials have this property. And I'll give a little bit more detail on what's going on here, okay? And they also conjecture a whole bunch of polynomials have this property. I'm just going to list a few of them that we have heard about maybe today already. Schubert polynomials and skew sure polynomials and maybe some other ones that I'm not going to list, okay? And without saying much more than this, one thing I will say is that these have a number of, all have a number of nice properties, which have kind of a, at least some of them have a combinatorial flavor. Okay, so the first one, which is very pertinent to some of the talks that we heard, is that they all have saturated Newton polytope. And in fact, the Newton polytope is a generalized permutahedron. Okay? And this is maybe why you'd expect some kind of matroids to pop up. This basically is saying that the kind of the edges of the, of the Newton polytope are, are all parallel to EI minus EJ. And that's exactly the sort of thing that you get with the matroid basis polytope. Okay? They're also robust to a lot of natural operations. Things like taking partial derivative. Things like taking some variable and scaling it. Maybe setting a bunch of variables equal. Okay, maybe taking products. There's a lot of different things. But the point is these are very natural operations that often have combinatorial interpretations. And this is, these are the things that are often used whenever you try to use these polynomials to prove different bounds. Say the bounds we're going to prove later. Or sometimes you can prove, use these polynomials to prove certain log concavity uh, statements, right? It, I mean, it, I, it seems clear that maybe you'd be able to do something like that. Um, and so often what you do is you have this big polynomial, you apply these operations, you get down to some sequence that you care about, and because these sort of preserve these properties, you end up with something that has log concave coefficients. Okay? And then, like I said, uh, I mean, besides the log concavity, there's a lot of negative correlation type inequalities that you can get from these polynomials. In fact, it's one of the, I would say, one of the main reasons these polynomials are studied. Okay? So this is kind of the realm that I usually live in. Um, but let's see what we can do with it better than permutations. So, so just, yeah. uh, when you say negative process, do you mean like with a constant one half? Or so, okay, or yeah, yeah, so yes. So with, with, with these, it's with a constant one half. With these, it's with a constant one. And, and I don't know, I guess. Some, something weaker, I guess. So here's another example, one that's harder, hopefully. So let's suppose we wanted to count lattice points of certain polytopes called transportation polytopes. OK? These have another name They're called contingency tables. Okay, I'll make a comment about that in a minute. So let me give you the definition here. So I give you some alpha, which is a non-negative integer vector of length m, and a beta, which is a non-negative integer vector of length n. And the transportation polytope associated to alpha beta is given as follows. So it's a set of all non-negative 
entry matrices, m by n, such that the row sums and the column sums are given by alpha and beta. OK? And like I said, the lattice points of these polytopes are called contingency tables. Okay, and so these contingency tables have been studied in a lot of different contexts. They originally appeared. Uh, they originally appeared in the context of statistics. Uh, they can be seen to represent sort of like the the dependence structure between random variables, where kind of you have some statistic along the rows, along the columns, and you see how those compare. Uh, you can, they're all, they're seen as lattice points of some interesting polytopes. That's how I've defined them, and you can also think of them as sort of like each one of them corresponds to a multi to a bipartite multigraph graph with certain uh, degrees fixed. So I have m vertices on one side, n on the other. I fix the degrees to be alpha and beta, and each one of these contingency tables is some bipartite multigraph with those specified degrees. Okay. So the goal then is to use this technique that I mentioned at the beginning to obtain some bounds on counting these contingency tables. Okay? There's been a lot of work on this before with actually uh, kind of similar bounds due to Barvinok, Barvinok, Hardigan, and actually Gervitz himself. Um, and what we're going to do here is going to strengthen those bounds. How would the sum of alphas to be equal? Sum of the alpha is equal to the sum of the alpha. Oh, uh, yes. So, so if, if they don't sum to be equal, then it's just an empty polytope. That's correct. So in the definition of DL for multivariate polynomials, uh, uh, so I mean, how does it work? Like you look at some special directions? Or yeah. So uh, unfortunately, yeah. So so the definition of Lorentzian is sort of the following. Uh, you have two conditions. One, you need some kind of support that's sort of matroidal. And then you need to be able to take partial derivatives down to quadratics. And those quadratics, if you look at the associated matrix, they should have some some spectral condition, one positive eigenvalue. That's the condition there. And the way that you then define this actually is to say, OK, well, take any one of those and just for every monomial, multiply by factorials associated to that monomial, and you'll get this class. So the definitions are, are more complicated. Um, th this is hopefully just to give you kind of a flavor of, of what they are. Um, but, uh, but that's how you would actually define it. Yeah. And so you do get certain lines are log concave, but actually, What's kind of interesting is not all lines will be log concave. There'll be certain coefficient lines that won't be. So, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So the 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 reason why we would even look at this problem beyond the fact that people are interested in these lattice points is. There, this kind of fits into this realm of problems that I was discussing earlier. To count these things can be extremely difficult. It's at least sharp p hard, where sharp p is the definition from Sui Hong's talk. Okay, it could be harder. I, I don't actually know. Um, but what is nice about these things is that there's a generating function which is very easy to evaluate. It's exactly the sort of thing that we're looking for. OK, so here it is. So I have some x variables and some y variables. And it's a formula we've seen a number of times already. It has a lot of combinatorial interpretations, OK? But it's this. And what this ends up being It's just the sum over all alpha and beta, the number of lattice points of this polytope times some monomial associated to this alpha and beta. Okay? This is not too hard to see. Basically, each one of these terms 
is sort of a, right, a geometric series. And which monomial you pick in that geometric series corresponds to sort of what number you put in that matrix entry. So if you look at the ij thing and I choose xi, yj to the k in the geometric series when I expand this, that's like me putting in the ijth entry for the matrix k. And if I fill in all these entries in such a way that the row sums and column sums are alpha and beta, I'm gonna, it's going to fit into the, it's going to add a 1 to this coefficient. So that's how that goes. Okay. And so our goal then is going to be to try to bound or probably more likely approximate this number. Okay, and the first thing we're going to need is some kind of generalization of this lemma that I wrote down at the beginning. Okay. Here's a theorem from the same paper. Suppose I have some polynomial, which has this denormalized Lorentzian property, and I have some alpha. Then we get the following generalization of lemma I wrote down. Oh. Okay. So the point here, this is somehow, right, this is exactly the term that I had before, but now it's just applied to sort of every variable and every entry of this coefficient that I care about. Okay? And now we want to we want to apply this to this generating function. We have a problem now. It's not a homogeneous polynomial and it's, you know, doesn't really fit into anything we've talked about. Okay? Basically, there's kind of a, a, a nice trick you can do, right? If I have some particular alpha and beta that I care about here, the entry of that particular, of some contingency table uh, with alpha and beta uh, row, and, row and column sums, every entry of that can be no larger than the largest entry of alpha and beta. Okay? So basically, what I can do is I can just take this generating function and just sort of truncate it to some degree and play some trick to get something that I can then apply this to. Okay? So if D is the max entry of alpha and beta over all i and j, then what I can do is I can just write down a new polynomial Where I just replace this geometric series with something a little nicer. Okay, so what have I done? Well, before I would have had an xi, yj to the k to infinity. I just truncated this to d. And then I sort of inverted y and added in some powers of y to make it a polynomial. Okay. This doesn't change the coefficient that I care about because I've made this d large enough. It's still going to end up counting everything. And now what you see is this is now exactly the type of polynomial that I told you was denormalized Lorentzian. Okay. This is a homogeneous bivariate polynomial with log concave coefficients. They're all just one. And now I'm just taking a bunch of products of them. Products preserve this property. Okay. And so that means that this sort of truncated version of this Generating function has this nice law concave property that we've been talking about. Okay? And so that immediately leads to 
the following corollary. So, uh, so, sorry to interrupt, but so you know this is dl on, did you know this is l or dl or? This is going to be dl. And it's not, not in l? No, because you would need uh, binomials here. You would need it to be ultra log concave coefficients. Okay. Again, the reason why is because these are DL. They have log, they have log concave coefficients, just one. And it's a product of those things. Okay. And so now, uh, you know, I've done this kind of twist thing, and maybe it's a little bit hard to apply this theorem directly, but there's sort of a symmetric version of this theorem that washes this away. And what you end up getting is the following corollary from the same paper. given these alpha and beta here. We basically get exactly the thing that we want, which is Same for the betas times this convex optimization. Okay? And you can also replace this by something a little bit simpler. It's something like e to the minus n minus m times the product of 1 over alpha i of alpha i plus 1 product 1 over beta j plus 1. Okay? And I'm not going to go through the computation because, you know, maybe we get to this point and you say, okay, great, you have some maybe algorithm for computing these things, which I think that that is already like a pretty good thing to have for this. And, you know, maybe with a not so great approximation factor if you don't like this simply exponential approximation factor here with these extra factors here. One thing you can do is, for example, if these alphas and betas are multiples of the all ones vector, there's a lot of literature on this already. But basically what you can do is you can compute this explicitly, kind of like what we did at the beginning of the talk. The symmetries of this G and the symmetries of these vectors, if you would pick something that's a multiple of all ones, would, would allow you to compute this directly and you'd get an actual lower and upper bound. Okay? Um, and actually I have a project with Alejandro where we're trying to push that idea a little bit further where we can explicitly compute this under a lot of a lot more situations, but I guess, you know, to, 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 be, to, be, uh, to be published at some point. Okay. So, this is the example with counting lattice points I wanted to give. Um, and with the last 12 minutes of the talk, I want to briefly give you a sense of how this sort of thing might relate to traveling salesman problem. So before I do that, do you have any questions about what I've done thus far? Yeah. So, uh, do you believe, uh, which one will, uh, do you believe which one is actually the closer to the right answer? Is it the upper bound or lower bound? Or maybe there's just no... So I will say, I will say the fall, so I don't know, but I will say this, there is a better bound you can get. I can't remember who it's due to. But I will also say that this is trivial. It's something that follows almost immediately from the definition of this generating function and from the fact that these are coefficients. This is the thing that's very, that was much harder to prove, um, but I don't know if that means that it's closer or not. It's the same exact thing in the permutations case, but then both sides were sort of off by about the same amount, even though the lower bound would be something that took work while the upper bound would be something that was kind of immediate from writing down the generating function. Or I guess the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it will kind of, when, for what families of alpha and beta can you actually compute this capacity? So this can be computed, um, let's see. So I believe that you should be able to compute this in polynomial time or at least approximate it much closer than this in polynomial time for uh, any alpha beta as long as, as long as like the time is depending on how large they are. But I think in terms of their bit complexity, I, I, I believe, though I, I have to. I actually, I'm, I'm asking for explicit answer like, something that's... Well, when you can, when can you literally bound this? 
Yeah. Like not with an algorithm. Yeah, like when, so for example, when all alpha and beta are equal, then probably. You get something explicit, that's right. You get something explicit. Are there some other families for you? So I would say that generally speaking, most families you cannot get something explicit for what equals this. But you can attempt to get some kind of bound. There's a way to kind of convert this inf into, a, into a supremum. This is sort of the work with Alejandro that we're working on. And once you have a supremum here, then you can kind of just pick something to plug in and it will give you some kind of bound. And then the whole trick is sort of determining what the best thing to plug in is. Um, but in terms of getting something explicit for this, I would say that it is very, very rare that you could, you could compute this exactly um, without any kind of bounding or approximating, something like that. Yeah? So for example, so, so the case when m equals n and you have uh, doubly stochastic matrices, can you, can you say something like with bounds of the volume of the Birkhoff poly, like how it compares to volumes of the... Yeah, so, so another thing you could do with this is you can, um, right, we're counting lattice points, but if you kind of scale up the alpha and beta in a, in a uniform way, you start to count, uh, you know, this very fine mesh of lattice points, and it will limit, in a certain sense, to the volume of the associated transportation polytope. And again, in that, so you would get some kind of bound with some kind of capacity here in general for the volume of transportation polytopes. Um, but if, if you're looking at something like the Birkhoff polytope, these will be something like multiples of all ones, and then you'll get some explicit lower bound, which... It's, it's not as good as the asymptotics that we know for the Birkhoff polytope, but it's, uh, I think it's correct up to the, t the first two uh, terms, I believe. Or at least the first term. I can't remember if the second term as well. Yeah? So, so there, uh, in, in that theorem, can you take P to be a short polynomial? You can. And I don't know what that gets you. But does that give you an algorithm for approximating Koska numbers? Uh, I mean, I guess up to some factor that's not that great. It'll be simply exponential, uh, and then depending on the size of alpha and beta, it could be potentially much worse than that. Uh, but in principle, yeah. Uh, the, as long as you can, I guess, you, yeah, you can evaluate your polynomials, yeah. But that is like a, it's a thing that follows from, it's like implicit in the literature, but I don't know, uh, I don't know, I don't know if anyone would care. I don't know, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure um, what people would think about that. But that's correct. Okay, well then I will do a very uh, kind of abbreviated version of what I was going to say for this last part. Just to give you a sense of how this relates to TSP. Okay. So this is the metric version of this problem, okay? Which says that you're given a complete graph with some positive weights. Which satisfy the triangle inequality. Okay, and your goal is to find the minimum weight Hamiltonian cycle. Okay, so this, is, this problem is famously hard to do. Okay, but when something's hard to do, people try to find approximation algorithms. So this approximation algorithm is due to Christofides and Sirtikov in around 76. They're separately, I believe, one sort of two sides of the Iron Curtain. But the, the algorithm here is sort of very simple sounding. You take a minimum spanning tree, call it T. You take a minimum weight matching. on the odd degree vertices, okay? And then you combine these to get C, 
with something called short cutting. So basically the idea is you take these two things, a minimum weight spanning tree, a minimum weight matching on the odd degree vertices of the tree. You union these edges. Okay, this is not going to be some Hamiltonian cycle, but basically every time you visit a vertex more than once, you can use the triangle inequality to sort of shortcut that vertex. You can do something shorter. Okay? And that's the algorithm, right? And the point is, this minimum spanning tree, it's, it's not hard to prove that this is going to have weight at most the optimum of this. And you can show that this matching is going to have weight at most half the optimum. Okay? And that's the 1.5 approximation. Okay? That's that. And so the problem with this is that you can't do any better than 1.5. You can give examples that are that are worse than one point, that are at 1.5, okay? But some people, uh, uh, Oves Garan, Saberi, and Singh in 11 had an idea to replace min spanning tree with a random spanning tree. distribution mu. Okay? And they were unable to show that this would actually improve the algorithm and expectation. Okay? But very recently, uh, Carlin, Klein, and Oves Garan, the same O here, the same O as the random walk on the basis of a matroid. Very recently, they were able to show for the first time since the 70s, so this was a big deal. Uh, that they could get a 1.5 minus epsilon approximation using this algorithm where epsilon is a little bit less than the Planck constant. So like 10 to the minus 36, I want to say. Okay? But because this is such a big problem and people care a lot, this was a big deal. Okay? And it's an open problem what the best you can do is Okay, and the idea is how did they do this? Well, the point is when they add this randomness in here, okay, basically you're not going to be able to do any better on the min spanning tree. The random spanning tree and expectation is still going to have the same kind of cost. The thing you might be able to do though is maybe this minimum weight matching is now a random thing and maybe an expectation it does a little bit better than half of the optimal cost and it, it does. That's exactly what they show here. And so the point is, what they need to do is they need to bound probabilities that vertices have even degree in the random t. Okay? The idea is if they can get some kind of handle on how unlikely it is that vertices in this random tree have odd degree, then they'll be able to get some kind of slight bound on this approximation factor, which is better than 0.5. Okay? And I will say about as much as I can say about how this goes in, a, in one minute. The idea is that you write down some polynomial associated to this distribution, which is a sum over trees, the probability of one particular tree times that monomial, okay? This ends up being real stable. And the idea is essentially what you do now is you would do something like the following, so let me give you a very simple example. Suppose now I wrote down another polynomial, which looks like this. I'll explain what I mean by this in a minute. So what do I do? I write down my polynomial, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in the same variable t for all the edges that are adjacent to some v. Okay? I'm going to plug in a different variable s for all the edges that aren't adjacent. 
the probability, the, sorry, the, the coefficients of this polynomial q are now exactly the probabilities that a certain number of edges are adjacent to v in this tree. Okay? And so then they are able to bound the coefficients of q, which are exactly the probabilities that they care about using this capacity method, which I have run out of time to say more about. So anyway, thanks for listening.